Welcome back to The Shed. We're here for episode 122 and for your amusement notification. Because that's why we exist. That's who we are. It's what we do. It's going to go on forever. You're going to have to listen to it forever. So hopefully you're enjoying it because we're enjoying doing it's beautiful it. Beautiful. we got a million things to cover. million things. Rich is going to continue to try to derail and interrupt. Derail. I know by long experience that pausing in these intros is a fatal error. So I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Let's just get going, have some fun, hope you come along, and happy to have you here with us. Okay, listener mail. Uh, actually, we have a listener mail that was sent to us quite a while ago, but we lost it. Uh, it was from Lee of Courtney, and it was about uh, bananas. That's right. When we had Nancy, and we, we did mention that Nancy and Lee appeared to be simpatico in the question of bananas, but we didn't have the email in hand. That's right. And it's that darn conversation view, you know. Again and again, when I've used conversation view, it's caused me nothing but trouble. You know, I'm, I've tried several email management tools, uh, none to any avail, and conversation management, just another one. New comment from uh, Lee of Courtney on episode 117, Spam and Banana Sandwich. Hi, dogs. An info-packed episode. And of course, I have some thoughts and comments on several items you covered. Regarding bananas, I read a comment from Nancy from New Westminster, and I'm kind of with her on preferring to skip eating bananas at all, in (laughs) any form. But if I do, because they are a handy food at times, I'm in the RJ camp. Bright yellow with some green. No softness, no brown spots. I peel from the top because the only banana I will eat is very solid. There's no danger of breaking it off. Although if it did, it would likely just mean I had less of it to eat, which would be fine. (laughs) I'm always uh, happy when anybody agrees with anything that I say. (laughs) (laughs) I'm also with Nancy's comment on RJ getting back to reading. Well, that went a different direction. (laughs) Like PJ, I read novels, almost exclusively 20th and 21st century, so the brain isn't heavily taxed. But the phone and other e-devices are the devil's candy when it comes to books. When I took my six-month hiatus from Facebook and used Twitter only for news and never read the comments... I found my brain coming back to being able to hold much longer pieces of information, like pages of a book, for example. You just have to decide to do it. Read something of a book every day, even if it's only for 20 minutes. Read in bed. Never take the phone to bed, or even have it beside the bed. Your brain will thank you for it. And in your mutual tailings stories, I noted that PJ said he had his tailings job in Cardston, Alberta. Although I don't know about tailings, I've been to Cardston a few times on my myriad trips to Saskatchewan over the decades. I usually went through, but one time decided to stop for lunch. Now, I'm just going to stop just for a moment. And PJ, I think we established after that episode that you, in fact, did not mean to say Cardston that's correct. say Carsland. That is correcto. And I spent some time uh, using, you know, Google Earth or Google Maps just to see. And yeah, I couldn't actually locate the plant, but it was not Cardston. That's correct. It was Carsland. Now that said, Cardston's an interesting place. And so we're going to read what Lee has to say here. And just as an aside for our Rosslyn listeners, Carol of Ottawa, formerly Carol Card of Rosslyn, is of the Card family that originated Cardston. Just a little piece of trivia for you. It's kind of a fun fact. Mm-hmm. She said, I've been to Cardston a few times on my myriad trips back to Saskatchewan over the decades. I usually went through, but one time decided to stop for lunch. To my dismay, I learned that Cardston was a dry town because Brigham Young's son had brought a bunch of his Mormon followers up from Utah and settled there, and Mormons don't drink. There's even a Mormon tabernacle replica built in Cardston. But that's not all Cardston had for surprises. As we were eating lunch, I looked out the window and saw a statue of King Kong in the plaza across the street. (laughs) What the? Turns out that Faye Ray was born in Cardston. Stop. Yeah. She was in the original movie, the beautiful young woman that King Kong picks up and carries away. And so there's a plaque, a picture, and a statue in the middle of town Kind of made up for that lack of alcohol. (laughs) (laughs) Now I want to go. I've never been to Cardston, 
it's just a little bit south of Lethbridge. So you got to add maybe an hour to your trip, I believe, because I think I could be wrong. I think it's 10 minutes or half an hour south of and west of Lethbridge. I wonder how old that King Kong statue plaque and picture thing is. Like it would probably was put up before the Second World War. It's been standing there for like 100 years or something because the original King Kong was made in the 30s, wasn't it? I think it was. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So that's great. That's fun. Susan from Rosslyn on episode 114, Lee goes to the Oscars, where we brought uh, Lee from Courtney in and talked to her. She says, I love Lee and agree with her on so many things. Number one, historical fiction. Lee made some excellent points. When it's a series playing week after week, people will believe it. And that would be regarding the crown, I believe. Mm -hmm. She says, it's a travesty. As someone said somewhere sometime, if you say something often enough, people start to believe it. It drives me crazy. Please, oh, please teach critical analysis in high school and keep reinforcing it. Number two, pots and pans, an old chestnut. I think we should talk about pots and pans every episode. What do you guys think? <laughs> no, I think no. She says again, the girl nailed it. Pots, something you will boil water and add pasta. Pans, something you will saute in. RJ, do yourself a favor. Now, what tone of voice is she using here? I don't know. This is mansplaining. <laughs> do She's yourself mansplaining. a favor and stop looking for science, logic, and consistency in recipes. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're following Alton Brown. Because recipes originated with people like my mom, who threw in a bit of this and a bit of that. By the way, i got to take a little sidebar here, guys. If you haven't noticed this, you're going to start noticing it. It probably won't drive you nuts, but it's quite interesting. Anytime on TV, especially in ads, but it can be on a series, that we're meant to think that someone's an amazing cook, a really cool cook, someone's maybe a hipster cook, they're going to have a bowl of salt, sea salt, great big crystals, and they're going to grab into the bowl with their hand, and they're going to go like this mm -hmm. above the food. And yep. that's, that's the symbol that this person's an amazing cook. So just do that. I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to have kosher salt. We actually have some kosher salt. Yeah. Put it on your breakfast cereal. You know, just all the crap that you would ordinary. If you get a, if you get any kind of takeout food before you eat it, just do that. And then, you know. So I'll be sweating reading the recipe for the third or fourth time. But when a house guest comes in, I'm going to reach for that bowl <laughs> and I'm just going to spread a little salt on stuff. Because I know what I'm doing. Actually, you could just do it over the sink. If you do it with <laughs> enough panache, it will still get the message across. Right? Like, uh, She says, I drive our friend CM, Cecilia of Vancouver, mad by not being able to give her the recipe for things that I do. I wish that I'd measured because then I might be able to reproduce some of the tastiest, but alas and alack, I don't. Plus, keep in mind that our cooking vernacular certainly in Canada, includes some British Isles terms. Uh, RJ, I loved your most excellent report on the Oscars. I'm going off to YouTube every Francis McDormand moment there ever was. <laughs> yep, it's pretty fun watching Francis McDormand direct people as she heads for the, for the stage. Uh, number four, and then Crash. Okay, so this is in reference to her loving and agreeing with everything that Lee says. All of a sudden we get a crash. Lee, Lee, Lee. Honeymoon's over. You criticize the quiet man, John Wayne, when he went off and did that Irish thing. First, he did not play an Irish man. He played an American, returned to the old soul of his ancestors, old spelled A-U-L-D. Second, an acquaintance of mine, Belfast resident, adored that movie. If a genuine Irish human thinks it's great, who am I to argue? I know it portrays an Ireland we all wish existed and also had some really misogynistic moments that make me grind my teeth. But it was a love letter to Ireland and John Wayne was at perhaps his most vulnerable in it. Plus, Maureen O'Hara, all I want to do is gaze at her cheekbones and sigh. <laughs> so that is true. Uh, I'm just thinking about whether we really actually think John Wayne being vulnerable is valuable or something we want to see. I don't know. 
Yeah, I'm not a big fan, John Wayne fan. I mean, he's uh, he's an actor that kind of plays himself. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah, he's one of those guys like, there's a bunch of them. We've talked about this a few times. Uh, actors who, if they are not themselves, they are the same character in every movie they play. That's how they get the roles. We want a guy who acts like Clint Eastwood in Dirty Harry. Well, let's get Clint Eastwood then and ask him to act like he did in Dirty Harry. So that's what I think about John Wayne. And finally, she closes with number five, Keanu Reeves. <laughs> Could we hear from our resident actor about his opinion? She capitalized actor to emphasize that two of us are not actors. Yeah, that we're not competent to offer opinions. Yeah, maybe yeah. our opinions are really not worth much. And in particular you pj she comes down hard on you she says rather than pj who obviously has unnatural aversion to this incandescent human being <laughs> incandescent pj less. talk to the hand yeah yeah kj talk. let's hear what do you think about keanu reeves no pressure take your time i personally don't think he's a very good actor I mean, he certainly looks good, and he knows how to do the moves, and sometimes he's quite decent, but I find him very wooden. Uh, and I think, I actually think a lot of his fans kind of fell in love with that part of his character, his makeup. But, I mean, I cannot imagine his Hamlet at the Manitoba Theatre Centre. I, I can't imagine it. But who knows? Is that knows? one of the one of his early pieces? <laughs> well, this that was after Bob and Ted, or whatever it was. Yeah, it was after that. It w oh, was no. it after the Matrix? No, no, it's before. No, 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 it was before the Matrix. But he he was obviously a big star, and he went back to Winnipeg to. He, I'm pretty sure his goal was to prove that he was an actor. He wasn't yeah. just some druggy guy. He was an actor. What's well, funny? An actor. Yeah. But I, I, I think that's right, because I actually like uh, watching his stuff. And it's probably for exactly that reason, Moby, that uh, I just like the character he plays. And like John Wayne, he just plays the same guy most of the time, doesn't he? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I haven't seen now. the w John Wick stuff, so I yeah. must do that. Yeah, but I... But I do, uh, as a human being, he's obviously kind of above and beyond. Yeah. But with John Wick, I, I don't like him because I don't go, oh, my God, is he a good actor? Of course not. It's an action film. I just like People the getting yeah. blowed up. Yeah, I just like the show, and I like what he, you know, he did great work on the um, physical aspects. So I think I should, first of all, just make it clear that I didn't ask Moby to call Kanunu Wooden. I did not communicate with him before this about that review. I got to ask you, though, did, did Susan ask for your opinion on this one? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right. Just, I'll just, I've filed that one away, RJ. You'll be hearing about that. Uh, from, um, from your lawyers, okay. And the other thing is, I do think that certainly my opinion of Kanunu is really badly distorted. Like, he was a young man when he made that Bob and, what was that movie again? The Excellent Adventure one. Bill and Ted's. Bill and Ted's. Bill and Ted. He was a young man. He was just starting out. And he became enormously uh, popular from that. And he then, I really do think he did want to kind of establish that he is a serious actor. I think he really did not want to just keep on playing Bill and Ted for the rest of his life. Right. And I think what really happened is it struck me all wrong that he would go back and do sort of Shakespeare in Winnipeg to prove, you know, I, I just thought, what is that? How were the reviews, you know, I wonder? I don't know. I, I just assumed they were probably not great. And I, I just, you know, it rubbed me the wrong way. And I never got over it. That's all it is. He has long since matured and realized what he is and is not good at. And so he plays roles that he's good at. And there's nothing the matter with that. And everything that you see about him in media indicates that he's a pretty great guy in real life, which is actually what matters. So, yeah, I like to make fun of him. And, yeah... This, that, and the other. But his action films are fun. He's a good action player guy. And no, we don't ask any action stars to have great emotional depth and range as they play these parts. We just act, ask them to really beat people up a lot and blow things up. So, I mean, all of that just goes to, is he a great actor? No, I don't think he probably is. But does he have to be? No, he's, he's making a great living and entertaining millions of people doing it. So 
And he's a good person. So why do we care? The end. Well, on the subject of movies, uh, we had a recent uh, eight-day holiday in uh, Vancouver Island doing the uh, circle route, the marine circle route, you know, going from Victoria west to Souk, then out to Port Renfrew, uh, and then the new highway that's paved that allows you to drive up to Lake Cowichan, and then east to Duncan and uh, back down to Victoria. It's a really beautiful route, highly recommend it, but... On the topic of movies, one of my favorite things on vacations, our favorite things, is uh, you get the back uh, to the room at the end of a, a long, uh, fulfilling, hopefully fulfilling day of vacationing stuff and uh, get to the motel room and watch movies. <laughs> like just movies you wouldn't necessarily watch at home, but there's no PVR. So you're going to choose something that's on. You typically yeah. start at halfway through or maybe not. Yeah. yeah, we watched The Big Chill again. Oh, mm. I never did watch that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it ages well. It it certainly has a look of a certain time, you know, the length of the shorts and the... Right, and The Big Chill, Kevin Costner's The Corpse at the beginning, isn't he? Yeah, which I never, no, never noticed. But, you know, there were, in my opinion, four movies made by that director... Lawrence Kasdan. Uh, right. I mean, he's made a lot of movies and, and he's one of those guys where he was hot for four or five movies. And then he's made a whole bunch that nobody ever paid any attention to. Hmm. But I mean, the cast, come on, Glenn Close, Jeff Goldblum, William Hurt, Kevin Klein, Meg Tilly. One of my favorite lines from The Big Chill is Jeff Goldblum after they get high the night before. He, Everybody's gone through the kitchen and they've gone, they've eat, got a little snack and everybody's going out for the morning jog or the morning walk and he comes into the kitchen and I, I think Glenn Close follows him or something. He says, are we the first ones up? <laughs> <laughs> he's always the last one up. <laughs> uh, he's great because he's just like, the here their good old friend died and his current girlfriend who's way younger is Meg Tilly. So Meg in the movie, her character is like 22 or something. And she's a total free spirit. And he's just hitting on her immediately, <laughs> which is quite funny. Even better is Body Heat. Oh, yeah. John, what was the name? It wasn't John Hurt. It was somebody else. Yeah, no, it was William Hurt. William Hurt. Sorry, not John. William. Here it is. 1981 film by uh, Lawrence Kasdan. So guess who's in it? This is pretty well their first movies. William Hurt, Kathleen Turner, her first movie, pretty well. I mean, they, they might have had minor movies, but these are their first main roles. Ted Danson, mm -hmm. before his TV work on Cheers. And he's great in this movie. Mickey Rourke. All downhill from there for Mickey. Well, Diner is Mickey's high point. Yeah. Anyway, have you seen Body Heat? Yes. It's a must-see. I have seen that. Yeah, and it's more classic than The Big Chill, I'd say. I think so, too. Yeah, before we move completely away from the Great Circle Route on the island, did you mention that you had have some automotive mishaps on that tour? Yeah, I did. I did. It wasn't a perfect vacation because of <laughs> these little things that happened. <laughs> you know? Such a tone of wistful regret. Did you, is it so, would it help to talk about it or would you rather just... You know what? carry this you know where i went wrong and this is a jinx thing i did the last time i renewed the insurance i've always had the opinion that you should carry a high deductible right because you're going to save so much money in the long run that it'll pay for that deductible several times over and it has you know i've always carried a 2500 hundred dollar deductible but this last time he said oh. usual 2500 deductible and i said you know i'm getting a little older now and so I think I'm probably a higher risk to the insurance company than they know. So I'm going to take the thousand deductible. So that's a little <laughs> predecessor. Uh, is that? But wait, this this should operate in your. F oh, I see. So the god said, "Okay, well he's he's now reduced his exposure, so we'll teach him a lesson about not trusting us." He's let himself go. Yeah, he's not trusting to the fates to keep his. Uh, his crazy high deductible plan valid. Mentally, so. he thinks he's going to be a bad driver. So let's make him a bad driver. That's yeah. how it all played out. 
So there we are in a very tight parking lot at the Chateau Victoria, and some dude had come into this tight area, and I kind of misunderstood what was going on. He actually was waiting for our spot, mm. and Sue directed him down to the end where he would be out of my way, but I didn't see Sue waving him kind of thing, and so I just go, okay, he's there. He's just one of those super slow people in parking lots you know the kind that will sit there and wait for someone to get out of their spot while having yes. 40 or 50 people lined up behind them one of those kind of people i just assume that and i'm in my normal brusque i know what i'm doing matter so i just pull forward out of my little parallel parking spot in this parkade it's oddly placed and i got just enough room i think to fit between him and some other car that's parked at an angle to my direction. And I got my backup camera, which I've gotten, I think, really good at. <laughs> so I think, oh, yeah, they always show you those lines down the side when uh -huh. you're backing up. And you got a yeah. good six inches, right? Yeah. Am I right, guys? Yeah, yeah. So no. back I go, doing my usual confident, moving a little faster than I should have. Quite a bit faster, I'd say. And then all of a sudden, on the right-hand side of the car, I can hear this. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You can feel it, too. Oh. And now I'm, oh, fuck. So I kind of have to keep going. So I keep going. And uh, it stops. The noise stops. And now I got to turn I'm between two rows of cars. And I, it's one of those things where you got to go six inches forward, six inches back, yeah, six inches forward. So now I'm already feeling like an idiot getting myself into a spot. Yeah, a 400-point turn. Yeah, and I, the whole thing could have gone way more smoothly. Anyway, I, I do that back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Now I'm free. And we pull to the other part of the parking is a small parking garage by the way and stop and get out and have a look and it's a series of scratches subsequently learned that they were just the clear coat mm -hmm. and the way you can tell that by the way i've learned is that if it gets wet they disappear mm -hmm. so if you ever do that if you get it wet they disappear that means it's just the clear coat and you can do something with it so they start at one point the back door and spread forward, because I'm backing up here, mm -hmm. spread forward over the front door and end up four inches wide just past the front door for a total length of, I think it was 38 inches or something. Mm -hmm. So that's super annoying, and I'm going, I'll try and cut polish it out at home, but I never had much luck with cut polishing. So there's that. So that's bothering me, even though I know we can kind of get it, get someone to polish it for us. I'm pretty certain, but I'm not totally certain. And it bugged me for the next like 24 hours, I'd say. And then so another three days later, we're towards the end of our trip now. We're in Duncan and uh, we're at the Best Western there. And you get out of the parking lot, out of the driveway onto the road. And the road's a feeder road to and from the highway, the island mm -hmm. highway. And it's a blind corner where we're turning left to your right. The, the road disappears around the corner. So it's a blind corner uh, turning clockwise from your view. And so nobody's coming. So I start turning and all of a sudden there's two cars coming from the right. I don't think they're speeding or anything, but there's two cars coming from the right and there's one car now coming from the left. So now I'm going, okay, so I go, oh shit. And I start backing up to get out of their way. Someone's blaring on their horn at me from behind. But I think now it's one of these cars on the road that's mm. pissed off because mm. I'm out in the middle of the road. And that island highway, man, people are cranky on it. That's what I just, you know, I could drive all over town here and people sometimes get cranky. But that island is... A lot of people driving way over the speed limit who clearly yeah. drive it every day and just are annoyed at all the tourists on it. And yeah, I think that's why the Malahat is such a disaster every time it snows. Yeah. Because people just way, way overdrive everything all the time. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, the guy's hammering on his horn and I back right into him. Oh, my <laughs> God. So I get out and he's yelling, what the fuck? You know, like. And I'm like, yeah, sorry, man. Like I'm clear, yeah. clearly I'm in the wrong and I don't want to be that idiot guy who's yeah. clearly in yeah. the wrong and decides he has to yeah. yell at the other guy. Right. So, yeah, there's a, you, you have to accept a pretty finite amount of abuse from the other driver. But usually I haven't had a lot of experience with this, but 
usually as long as you show your belly, it just stops. Yeah. The other guy just, he's annoyed and he's, he's definitely going to continue to let you know that he's annoyed, but he's not going to be all nutty. He's just going to take your damn information and go away. And I don't think it was his and his girlfriend's first rodeo because she was off. They were off waving down a witness right away. Oh, yeah. And I had no issue with that. Like, yeah. Well, how do they know I'm going to be honest, right? Yeah. I had no issue with that. So we all kind of crossed the road to a kitty corner parking lot and pulled in and I was just so embarrassed. Yeah, that's a drag. And I, yeah, I wrote them, I basically wrote them a note saying, yeah, it was me. I was in the wrong. I'd done it. After which I read the ICBC guidelines. Don't discuss who is at fault, you know, because ICBC as your insurer wants, you know, they don't want those edge cases Yeah, where maybe it was the other person's fault, but you think it's your fault. They don't want you talking over whose fault it was. They they want to be the judges of that. Do you want to hear the really cynical, super cynical ICBC insider and also lots of other people view of that? Okay. ICBC makes a lot more money if more than one person is at fault. Because everybody's premiums get to go up if more than one person is at fault. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that that could be it. So that, please don't yeah. take a hundred percent responsibility voluntarily, because if we could, we'd rather stick it to more oh, than one person. That's probably why back in 1981, which was my last at fault accident, I was parallel parking, and I had a belief that as a parallel parker, it is your right to back in, and it is the right lane's responsibility to wait and let you park, which is all true. But they're going, yeah, it doesn't matter though if it's your right; you still need to be a defensive driver. Mm. you know which was quite interesting for me and yeah. uh but yeah maybe that explains why they gave me a 50 50 on that one i mean i'll just say i'm not sure how well founded that cynical belief is and in anything other than just pure cynicism i'll just say that i just know a lot of people are very often surprised to find out that something was 50 50 um they they just don't understand why they're half responsible for something. By this point, I'm, I'm just befuddled, right? I'm an old man <laughs> and I'm looking at the back and I'm going, Oh my God, there's a, my bumper has a big piece of metal cut into it. Oh, not, not realizing that all these bumpers are plastic. Yeah. And all I'm looking at is just some gray colored plastic. It's not metal at all. Right. Cause, uh, it doesn't look all that bad. You know, you can see it if you're looking over the bumper, but it's not a big deal really. Because to replace those bumpers are one or two thousand dollars. I'm going to find out. I should find out, but we probably won't replace it. Oh, but then I got a question for you about deductibles. You probably know this. I found myself. Oh, I never thought about that. So I have a thousand dollar deductible. I assumed that regardless of deductible, the insurance company would pay a hundred percent of the other driver's claim. But that's not true, is it? No, that is true. As long as you're 100% responsible, they will pay. Oh. But then they'll collect from me my deductible, won't they? Yes. Okay, so so that means that if if I'm already in $1,000 on the other driver. Yeah, you may as well just make your claim. Yes, if if I'm, yeah, because you get hit by one claim, regardless of whether it's $1 or... $3,000, $3,000, the insurance company's out of pocket, and they mark that on the claim count. Yeah, and the buyout thing. Can you buy out? Yeah, you can, I believe. You can pay all the expenses for you and the other driver, yeah. and, there, and, and then you won't have your deductible taken, and you won't have that accident count against your CRS. I don't know if that's current, but five years ago yeah, that was current. I'll, pro- I'll probably buy it out then. It's going to be a few grand probably by the time the other guy and you are both done. I think so, because, you know, the other guy, of course, didn't look bad either. But we, we all know how this goes. Once those plastic bumpers get a few cracks in them, yeah. the only solution is to replace everything. Yeah, and you've green-lighted him to do it for free, so he will. Um, well, it was a rental car, so there was no just, there was no chance of saying, hey, look, can I just pay oh, you 500 bucks? Oh, I didn't bucks? realize. I thought you were driving. Oh, of course. Okay, well, yeah. then, yeah, you're, the whole conversation is moot then. It's academic. My car was not a rental, but but his car was a rental oh. car. Oh. Yeah, so his car was a rental car. So, again, there, there's no, here, I'm just going to slip you 500 bucks and let's all forget about it because yeah, it, no. it didn't really look all that bad. Um, but no, yeah. and that's one of those really high trust situations, right? So that one I found even more idiotic. There's one thing around, it's stupid to take risks on your backup camera. 
I mean, I've done some measuring and I know where the red line is. I've been pretty good about that. But anyway, there was that. And Sue said, you know, because there was one other incident two years ago, backing up. So he said, you know, they've all been backing up, right? <laughs> what? Um, yeah, every single one of my three incidents oh, really? have been me backing up. So well, that's an interesting observation. <laughs> that's wow. a really good observation, point taken. Yeah. You know, it really, that actually is a helpful observation. So <laughs> so that's my little thing. And that, that got me upset for another 40, 24 to 48 hours just because... It's so stupid, you know, like, <laughs> oh my, somebody's honking at me. I think I'll back up without looking behind me. You know, you got a backup camera for but God's this, sakes. You don't even have to turn your swivel your head. It's but that's right. one of the reasons I get so annoyed when people use their horns uh, egregiously is because the horn prompts impulse behavior. That was not egregious. That was you're no, about to run into me. I get could it. He, but could he have slammed it in reverse, look behind himself? I'll bet you he could have, but still, that would have required him to have perfect he reactions. Would, well, and he'd put himself at risk doing that. But he'd have to have the same thing. Look so I wasn't, I wasn't complaining about him honking at you in this situation, but quite often when you get honked at, especially people who are stopped somewhere waiting to make a turn, and somebody behind them honks, and you'll see their car lurch because they immediately take their foot off the brake because they're getting honked at. And... It happens whether it's good for them to go or not, right? Like, anyway, that's a drag. That's a drag. Getting back, I thought, well, I I Googled how to fix these kind of scratches. You know, the scratches down the side. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, the reason that that cut polish never works is you're supposed to precede it by using various grains of sandpaper and wet sanding it. Which to me is a very scary proposition. Me too. I mean, I don't mind learning how to do stuff. I sort of do mind, actually. I don't like doing anything if I'm going to fail at it. So that's why I don't try <laughs> half the repairs that you guys have done. That's why you're not an artist today. <laughs> I'm definitely not going to be doing it on the side of a, a car, right? And having to replace the entire yeah, paint yeah, job. Yeah. So I start Googling around to these places that are like detailing places. Yeah. And I find unique mobile detailing. And they come out in a truck and they set up a little uh, kind of a tent over your car so the sun's rays aren't on it. And they will wet sand and they will wow. polish and they'll do everything, right? Wow. So I call them up and I talk to the owner. The owner goes, oh, yeah, yeah, but uh, from the way that you've described it, I might be able to fix it, but you better take it down here. I send the guys out and they, they do mostly, you know, just the polishing jobs just to kind of renew your entire car without any serious damage on it. But this one sounds pretty serious. Not sure I can fix it. Bring it down for an estimate. So I bring it down to his place, and uh, it's a place off Marine Drive near the uh, freeway there, Highway 1, and um, park next to a Rolls-Royce. Did and you door him? <laughs> it's a, yeah, yeah, I'm sure I have enough room, right? I'm backing up. And... Uh, it's a beautiful car, and it has a particular tannish gray color that's just awesome. Anyway, we don't talk about the Rolls Royce. He comes out and looks at it. He goes, oh, okay, yeah. I think I can do something with this. Yeah, I think I can. Yeah, I could probably do it. This little area where it moves from the door to the fender, that area, not sure because it kind of curves inwards a bit. I go, well, okay, so how much time? He says two or three hours. Oh, sounds great to me. It's a hundred bucks an hour. I mean, I don't want to feel bad about this door every time I kind of get absolutely. a look at it. Yeah, absolutely. In, For 300 bucks, if I had it, I would do it because yeah. 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 So he says, okay, now what we're going to do when we start is we're going to give it a full chemical wash and he starts throwing a whole bunch of jargon at me. He's going, we remove the blah, 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 and it fixes the blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'm going, okay. I'm thinking. <laughs> Uh, I don't watch care, out just fix it. And then he goes, he goes, yeah, and then when we're done, we want to do a, what we want to do is a, a clay bar. We run some clay bar over the car. We do a nice polish and that gets the chemicals, a little, the bird droppings. I guess that was for the wash part. I don't know. He's just talking at this point. It's just blah, blah, blah in my ears. And there's a whole bunch of jargon I've never heard before. So at the end of it all, I go, actually, I had my 2002 Camry and I never really, I thought the paint was fine the whole time, the time I owned it. So just, just. Just to remove the scratches there. He says, okay, I understand that. Okay. 
I have to come down the next day to drop it off and drop it off. And uh, Sue comes down with me. We could do the Prius Prime on the way there. She drives the car home. I So I go to pick it up and he says, you know, I just couldn't bear not not doing the shine afterwards. So I did a shine for you. I had no charge. And the thing, <laughs> the car is just like a miracle to behold, <laughs> right? He goes, just feel that metal. And I feel the metal and it's like, oh my <laughs> My finger just just floats along it. It's like it's like liquid. It's just like the most smoothest smooth I've ever felt in my entire life, right? And then we go over and we feel Sue's car, and it's like you know, it's a brand new car, right? I guess it was from all those months sitting out there in storage, but it does not have that in the acid thing, rain, right? Yeah. Okay, well, you got to tell us the name of this. Is this is unique? What are they? U- unique detailing, which is also advertised themselves as unique mobile detailing. Okay, what was the tab? Well, he said I didn't charge you for it, so he charged me the three hundred bucks, which was you know it was going to be two to three hours, and who knows how long these guys take to do the. Uh, Doesn't matter as long as it was what he told you and you'd accept it. Absolutely, and I was just so pleased with it, and we came to do the charge card and. You know, I have my ongoing joke with places that you would never leave a tip. And, uh, you know, when I put my card in and then I say to the person, tip amount, right? <laughs> and it always gets a laugh, Jeez. right? That's just so offside. That's why it gets a laugh. And so that's running through my head that, you know, there will never be a tip amount, but, you know, I'd almost leave a tip. And so I put my card in and up it comes, tip amount, <laughs> I'm going, what? So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, okay, now what? Because I was thinking I'd leave a tip and he reaches over and touches the no tip for me. So oh, really? Because I, eh? oh, you know, I would have tipped him. Because he knows that I'm going to, he doesn't know I have a podcast. Yeah, but. He does know there's a tell your friends thing going on. And he does know that a year or two from now when I feel the car, it will no longer have that amazing yeah. feeling. Well, probably a week or two, but it doesn't, again, as long as visually it's not there, the tactile thing is pretty distant second, right? It's just like, okay, it doesn't feel dreamy smooth to your fingertip as dreamy smooth as it did on the day. But yeah. as long as your eye isn't offended and you don't have to pluck it out, you're good. Right. So we'll see what happens. I'm curious what happens when the gray bar wears off. Do those little scratches come back? Yeah. So we'll see about that. That's that's a great one. I'm glad you managed to remember to tell us that because that's a great. Because I've detailing is one of those things where quite often Haley once had a car detailed and it came back and it was still dirty below the uh, on the on the curved under part of one of the doors. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You sort of think, come on, you're supposed to detail it. That actually includes washing it. You know, like come on. And yet, you hear a story like that for 300 bucks. I mean, that Suzuki I drive, it has bird poop scarring on it. It has a whole bunch of really terrible touch-up stuff done to various paint before and after I owned it. And I mean, I kind of wonder, if I took it to a place like that, I wonder what would happen. <laughs> you know, like... Yeah, well, I think this guy, I highly recommend him. And I, then I asked him afterwards about the rolls. Because on the way out, before I, before I left, I said... Uh, Oh, I'll bet you the Rolls guy paid a lot more than I'm going to pay. <laughs> and he laughed about that. And then afterwards I said, so what's the deal with the Rolls? He says, well, Rolls Royce lends it to us. And then um, we don't use it. But what happens is they pay us and, P- nice. and Rolls Royce will tell a prospective customer, oh, yeah, you can go uh, take a, a drive in this one. Because I don't even know if they have a dealership in town here. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. But if you want to drive, you go there and you drive it from there, they'll lend it to them for a day or a week or something. Nice. And then it gets back and they fully detail it again. So the next purchaser will come to a pristine looking car again. So Well, and it's a great ad for their business, right? Like somebody owns a Rolls, brings it here. It's a real testament because the Rolls guys are happy with them. Whatever magic they do on the paint apparently does not wear the paint down. That's interesting. Jeez, I thought for sure you were just going to say it belonged to the proprietor. Nope. Like I, but the proprietor did go golfing the next morning. Uh, he couldn't do it the same day because he was going golfing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was that day actually. So I, but uh, he seemed a like a story. he seemed like a really nice guy, and he's featured in all their videos. Him and some other guy are doing the oh, work, yeah. so you get to watch the work happening in the videos. I should look at some of those. <laughs> That's very good. 
That was very good. Garburators. RJ, I know you have one. KJ, I don't know if you do or not, but I want to know in one word, yay or nay on garburators. Nay. KJ? Um, Whatever goes into the sewer has to get taken out of the sewer. That's not a yay or nay. Uh, No, we have one upstairs, but it, it doesn't get used like as a garburator. So are we you in, are you in favor? No. Yeah, okay, me neither. Because I just think they're more trouble than they're worth. RJ, I'm surprised because I thought you used yours quite a bit. Well, we did right up until the uh, city started collecting compost. Oh, okay. Mm. So, I mean, the garburator pulverizes it. And as Moby says, it's going to have to get removed at the processing plant. Yeah, 100. It's yeah. more sludge. It is food sludge, so I like to think that whatever they do with it is productive. Hopefully, somehow. well, you never yeah. know. They might have to use more chemicals just to break it down. So bad for the environment. So I think composting is better for the environment overall. And so that's our preference. We only use it occasionally if something kind of mistakenly got rinsed down there. Hmm. <laughs> Well, okay. Thank you for that. I just, the conversation was just, I've never in my whole life found them particularly useful or sensible. I don't know why. I just, and yet they're a thing. I've repaired and replaced a few of them over the years, but I just never really felt the loss or lack of one if I didn't have it. And I just wondered how you guys felt about them. I think, I think the general idea was less uh, garbage. Yeah. That was the idea. And whether or not that was a good idea or not. Because, you know, if you think about it, if food sits in the garbage, it breaks down. Yeah, but it also draws flies and stuff, you know. Though. Yeah, well, that's natural. It's nature. And so it breaks down and, and everything compacts eventually. You know, <laughs> once it's 10 foot down and, and there's big there's air pockets there, it does compress. So it kind of goes away. Mm. Um Whereas maybe they need some chemicals and whatnot to process it at the plant. Yeah. Okay. Just checking in on that. I did have one more on here. Have either of you listened to the Al Franken podcast? No, sir. So for anybody who's listening who doesn't know, Al Franken is a former Saturday Night Live comic who then turned into a fairly long-term serving senator in, I think, Minnesota. Comic and writer. Comic yep. and writer, that's correct. And so he's been doing a podcast that I ended up watching. And it's pretty good. It's really funny, but it's also very informed. Like it's it's uh, it's on politics. And if he was a Democrat and he continues to have those views and he pillories some of his enemies, but it's all factual. He talks about voting records and strategies that are in play and all kinds of stuff like that. It's just a lot of fun. His latest ones are called The Only Former U.S. Senator Currently on Tour Tour. That's He's going around on tour, and that's the name of his tour. Yeah, he was a great senator, like so well-spoken. And he, he and his staff did incredible research. So yeah. kind of like AOC in that way, uh, extensive use of a super smart staff who focus on the actual issues and not so much on... Not as much on where are our dollars coming from. Yeah, and I think the podcast is kind of like that. It's it's pretty articulate and it's pretty funny too. So. And he he got hit pretty hard by the wokies. Yeah, was he sober skin? I don't know. No idea. I didn't uh, know that he had a drinking issue. Did he? Oh Jesus! Don't they all? Every time he comes on, Rachel or Chris Hayes, he's <laughs> hambiga. Oh is my he? God! And I it's, didn't know that. it's so embarrassing because I know how smart he is and what a good senator he, he was, and he's always just a little bit. Oh, really? Eh? Well, I, if he is, I just haven't noticed it. I I can't say that I know for sure. No, he probably wouldn't be on his own podcast. Yeah, it's, it's fun, anyways. Just fun. Just thought I'd throw that out there for you. No, that's good. I'm gonna have a listen, actually. Although I have too many podcasts, but you know, just gotta trim some old other ones. Yeah. Really got to recommend The White Saviors. It's one of the Canada Land set of podcasts. Um, some or most of you were, may have heard about the We Charity. Absolutely. 
The big scandals, yeah. Big scandals, and that's when they came into the public eye was, oh, you know, does we pay Trudeau's mother to present? But that's the least of it. It's it's a really problematic organization. They call the series the White Saviors because, you know, well, first of all, there's two things. There's the We Charity, which is a registered charity. And then there's the Me to We Foundation, which is not a charity at all. It's for profit. (laughs) <laughs> and there's all kinds of blurred lines between who works for the charity or who works for the nonprofit. People are hired into the charity, and the next thing you know, they don't realize they're working for a profitable organization. And uh, what kind of charity is there? You'd think it's to help people in Africa and the Amazon and places like that by building wells and building schools. That's the way they, they market themselves. But it turns out the real charity is to get high school kids to feel good about themselves. <laughs> so basically, you got to pay to go on one of these trips, right, to Africa or to wherever. So the parents pay. Um, oh, also, they go all across Canada having these big high school events that are like TED Talk style things where the, yeah. the two brothers that are the wee brothers come walking out to blaring music and they're talking all enthusiastically and motivatingly to all these formative, you know, 15 and 16 year old kids about how they can change the world. They end up in Africa uh, building the same schoolhouses over and over again. They all get their little photo opportunity where they get a picture of a brick and some mortar and a trowel and a, a whole bunch of little black school kids surrounding the, the white heroes. Also grateful to our, our white saviors. Anyway, fantastic podcast. Highly recommend it starting from episode one forward. And like how many episodes are there? Like, does this just, they just bring up a new something about this company every episode? Yeah. Yes, every episode moves into a different area of the problematic nature of that entire endeavor. And they haven't even hit the political scandals. Oh. The political scandal was that they awarded them a massive hundreds of millions of dollars contract to do good works without making a competitive bid. And how long have they been in business, we, the we guys? They started maybe eight or ten years back. Oh, okay. And it was a 12-year-old kid, uh, Craig Kielberger and his older brother, Mark, or I might have gotten the names backwards. So as a 12-year-old, he went in all these venues saying that he wants to fight child labor. And his 17-year-old brother chimed in, yeah, I'm supporting my younger brother in this. And the parents were behind the scenes manipulating everything. And it turns out that the We Charity itself um, supports companies that do child labor, like the Hershey Corporation. It oh. still still hires people, child laborers, to do the chocolate harvesting. Uh, it goes on and on and on. Every episode is a different aspect. One episode is uh, a tape of one of the Kielbergers themselves talking to a man in Africa about a possible hit job. Because uh, they're attempting to bribe the local government and uh, one of their workers is going to spill the beans. So it uh, goes on Jeez. and on. Yeah, it never ends. And is it out of commission now? No, the organization continues. Oh. Um, so it's <laughs> it's really a good one to listen to. I mean, okay. you hope that they'll go down hard, but it's hard to say. First thing I thought when you said, you know, it comes as a surprise that they're for profit was... It was Value Village. For years and years and years, I thought Value Village was a charitable organization. You know, they, they give a leg up to people who can't get a job anywhere else. Da, 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 da. Well, that part's probably true, but no, they're a fully for-profit thing. Yeah. When you donate clothes to Value Village, you're putting money in some rich person's pocket, basically. Mm-hmm. Who knew? It took me a long time to find that out. Yeah, and it's I'm, it's no doubt privately held, so you don't know how rich they are, but I, I imagine that they're making some pretty good money there. Eh? Yeah, because they don't pay much. They hire people who can't get jobs anywhere else, which allows them to put a gun to their head with regard to, you know, paying benefits. But their their shtick, the We Foundation, is charitable, and therefore is heavily audited. And the way they got around about that heavily auditing was to start the Me to We Foundation, which is not charitable. And start to blend and blur the two. It's it's yeah. actually uh, the first time it's been done in Canada. 
That's kind of interesting because I really never did understand much of anything about the whole scandal around Trudeau and the party and all the rest of it. But given your description of the organization, you can see how that would get messy real fast. Well, I think all charities and churches, for that matter, should be treated as as fully taxable. Yeah, me too. And because if they're charities, then they're going to pay net zero tax anyway, right? Because they're not going to make a profit. Yeah. And then that way, if, oh, this year, oh, we made a profit, but don't worry, we're going to, we're going to give that back. That's fine. You're just going to pay some tax this year. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Just yes. And the churches, please, because the church is the biggest money-making racket out there for the last two or 3,000 years going, right? Yeah. It's pretty, it's terrible. Okay. So that was the white saviors? Yes. Okay. Yep. That, that sounds like a possible. Start to finish. Every episode unveils <laughs> something amazing. As long as I don't end up, you know, wanting to slit my throat at the end, I guess that's fine. That's good. It's time again for KJ Snappers, wherein our own KJ dog tries to stump the panel with etymological quandaries he's stumbled across in his travels, and in which PJ and RJ search deep into their time-addled memories to see if they can piece together the meanings and origins of these terms. So let's play KJ Snappers. Okay, uh, I won't even look because I know the first one is, who knows what a paternity list is in baseball? Wow. So it's when one of the young wives has a baby. <laughs> and they and want we to run down the list of potential uh, yeah, fathers? Potential that... fathers, exactly. <laughs> a paternity no. list. I'd never uh, heard that term before, and it had something to okay, do well, with... Okay, well, don't tell us yet. Don't tell us. No, I don't know what it is. Okay, well, I'm going to take a guess here before we do any research, and the guess is going to be you are trying to determine the nationalities of your roster because you're only allowed to have players from certain places in such percentages. Well, that maybe? sounds weird. But, I know, but, but like a paternity list for baseball sounds ultra weird. It doesn't sound very uh, free marketish to me. Oh, oh, I got a better one. I got a better one. It is the list of parent clubs. So, like, if you're playing double A ball in Fresno, oh. you're affiliated with somebody who is affiliated with, and then you're, you know, you're affiliated with a triple a team that's affiliated with some major there's a list that's my guess on that's pretty good a, p- a parent team there yeah you go. that's a good one skinny <laughs> okay guys what is it uh uh by the way skin i was buying into your your thing which is totally wrong but i was buying into it <laughs> um so i just want to confess to that okay we got it here the paternity leave list oh because well, you mentioned that's a key omission exactly uh, and and maybe there's also a paternity list. But anyway, the paternity leave list may be used when a player chooses to leave the team to attend the birth of his child. A player placed on the paternity leave list must miss mm. the next team game, but no more than three games. And can probably be substituted for. So it's really like, just a an employment. I didn't hear the leave part of it, but I now that you say that, I think they might have been talking about that at the time. Isn't that funny? Okay. <laughs> my bad well here's a different one what is the mlb paternity list so it's this one's not using the word leave um, well then I'm, I'm just going to stick with my prior one then it is no it is even the paternity list allows players to lawfully leave a team when their spouse is in the process of delivering birth to a mm. child so so it does get sometimes called the paternity list okay oh, what I else see. what else you got there that was a good one um Okay, here's one. A bottle opener. You know the old style bottle openers, like the church key? I think so. It's a, uh, I don't have a sample right here. Is the, oh. There's the old style one that is both a can opener and a bottle opener. Yeah, this one, this yes. one sort of has a paint opener at one end, a tiny little tip at the bottom end, but it's literally yeah. one wire, one metal wire in a triangle. And in that triangle at the top, there's a little tab and on the two sides, there's a little tab. Now, do you guys, I don't know if you remember this, but I mean, would you guys open it like going down like this over the bottle or going up like this? 
I always uh, opened it going up, like Me place, too. place the two, the, uh, the two key. tabs. The yep. Two. I always thought there was a single tab that went underneath the uh, bottle, open uh, the bottle cap, and then I would pry up with it. But maybe I, I haven't paid close enough attention. No, I think it doesn't kind of matter because you have two choices on how to lever it off. You can pull down on the handle and lever the cap, the far side of the cap upwards. Oh. You can lift up on the handle and lever the near side of the cap upwards. And I always pulled up. I don't know why, just did. KJ, you pulled down? Well, it's be- I think it's because all the new ones are like the ones that don't, it, they're not even built like that anymore. You just naturally, they naturally are, are formed, I think they are, to go up. Like the top of a corkscrew, you know, that's a combination bottle opener. It's usually yes. up. Maybe it's not. Oh. Yeah, those ones, those ones that are, that you can't do anything but up on those a wine yeah, yeah. corkscrew bottle openers. You can only go There's up. There's just on a one those. option. But any of the ones where there's a circle with a handle at the bottom and the circle has two or three tabs on it, you, you have a choice. You can go up or down. Okay, here's another one. Does anybody know the term Argo meets stripes? I'm thinking it's from a Greek mythology or something like that, but uh, Chris Hayes used it. Argo meets stripes. How is Argo spelled? A-R-G-O-T. A-R-G-O, I think. What is it, skinny? Well, so I declared with confidence, as I so often do, based on nothing. I think he's making a reference to two movies. He's he's talking about some situation. And in one situation, Argo, it's very serious, well-executed, and uh, precise. And in another situation, Stripes, the movie with Bill Murray, it's oh, crazy, nice idiotic one. foolishness. Isn't Argo the releasing of the Canadian hostages or the, the yeah. American yeah. hostages? By the Canadian Embassy. Yeah. That's a good one, Skinny. That's I was what I, sure that that's it was what I think a he's doing. mythical. <laughs> well, I don't know the movie Argo at all, and I don't know the word Argo, so I was, uh, it's a stretch, but I was going to say stripes is a particular pattern, and that Argo could be a particular pattern on clothes. And so the term would mean that these two situations being compared are totally different. I'm almost certainly wrong, but I'm just going to toss that one. No, I believe I believe Skinny's right on this one. Yeah, Ar- Argo is with um, Ben Affleck. Anyway, moving on. I just want to remind everybody that the Loopers are back in full force. The Looper Moths, and Absolutely. I've seen a story about Looper poop having to wipe Looper poop off railings because there's so many of them. They're not that bad up here this year. There's a bunch of them around, but like last year, there's just clouds of them around. There's still corpses in my place from last year. This year, they're around, but not so okay. bad. Vituperative. No idea. Oh. V-I-T-U-P-E-R-A-T-I-V-E. I know that. It's vituperative. I don't know why, but I always affiliate this in my mind with snake bite and snake venom. But it is angry. It is abusive language. A vituperative language is angry and abusive and usually at high volume. I believe that's what's going on there anyways. That's really good, actually. The uh, Oxford Dictionary says bitter and abusive. And their usage example is the criticism soon turned into a vituperative attack. Yeah, it's one of those really good words for... You know, when you say pejorative, yes, you can move up from there to vituperative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, there's, you know how that goes. There's there's all those words that they use. Yes. Vituperative was one that was popular at some point. They go through phases. Of yeah, these. you learn it in college. Yeah. And you stop using it after college unless you become a writer. Yeah, and they just, they come and go. Like, we had this in the office environment where there was always phrases that would become popular because maybe somebody wrote a book or gave a course and then they would be around and everybody would be using them and then they would just sort of fade away and you wouldn't have to deal with how annoying that <laughs> was anymore. <laughs> Are we, do we have any more short snappers? Yeah, I got a couple. Want them? Oh, Let's lay them on us. Let's do them. Yeah. Uh, where did the phrase Jerry rigged come from? Ooh. So first of all, the oh, definition is a thing where you just kind of, oh, skin knows it, 
but just I believe jerry rigged means uh, you've been really uh, resourceful with whatever you have at hand. You MacGyvered it. Makes <laughs> MacGyver. Yeah. That's what that's the word I was looking for. Anyway, PJ, you have. Uh, I think a it thought? comes from jury. In, in the sailing days, there was they would jury rig masts and sails, which I, meant. I wondered if it was actually jury rigged. I, I, well, I think it's a corruption of jury rigged. That's what I think jerry rigged oh. is. Is a corruption of jury rigged. I could be wrong, but that's Say what again I think. about jury rigged the, the, on the well, ships. jury rigged in sailing terms means you make a temporary arrangement to keep a mast or a sail in place and functioning when it has been damaged. You use other ropes and other pieces of wood to tie it into place, and you it's temporary. It's it's to get you through whatever you need to get through until you can have it properly repaired. And why would it be named that though? Why would I have no idea why how how they came up with jury rig uh, as the term for that? You know what jury? Did twelve guys put their heads together to try to figure out how to fix this thing? I don't know. Maybe. Well, just off the top of my head, I'd say that the phrase "jury rigged" has been in use since at least seventeen eighty eight. The adjectival use of jury in the sense of makeshift or temporary has been said to date from at least 1616. But see, have you guys ever heard jury used as an adjective? That's a pretty jury looking fender on there. Right. <laughs> you know, like, right. No. So it's so it's an old word, but the the term jury rigged has lived on. But yeah. the term jury is no longer used for that. But yeah, it's jury rigging, also called jerry rigging, is both a noun and a verb. So when you're on a boat and you yeah. look up at the jury rigging, that's the stuff that you put up because you're going to die if you don't put something up quick yeah. before you get yeah. back to port. And you and yes, a verb. You hear it used as a verb. We got to jury rig something for this. Or we're going to get soaked. Mm. You know, yeah. like put a tarp up when you're camping. Okay, KJ, one more. Yeah. Uh, one more, um, I don't know, antecedent? Oh, a thing that comes before. Oh, it comes after. Oh, right, 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 right. Precedent. Oh, it's just the opposite of... Precedent. Uh, okay, the last one we'll say today is jibe. Jibe? Like, that doesn't jibe with that doesn't what jibe. my expectation yeah. was. That doesn't align. As in jib from sh- old shipping? <laughs> uh, again, with boats. No, again, a jibe... A uh, ship may be said to jibe at its mooring when it goes with the waves and tugs at the ropes, you know. I think that's called jibing as well. I'm not really sure of that. Uh, it will jibe. But the common usage is, yes, that doesn't jibe. Those facts or those things don't go together. They don't And does that get mixed up with jive? I think so, yeah. Jive might be a corruption of jibe, but I'm not sure. Pretty, pretty deep knowledge you got there, Skin. You're, you're really uh, hitting it out of the park with these. <laughs> I mean, just knowing that they're nautical terms, right? But anyway, there's a specialty article by Merriam-Webster since 1828. <laughs> uh, and this, this is on, the article title is Jive versus Jibe versus Jibe where the latter two, one starts with a J and one starts mm. with a G. So we got jive, as in jive, jive turkey. And two versions of jibe with a B. Does your jibe jibe with your jive? Is your jibe jiving with your jibe? This trio of words has some overlapping qualities, not to mention letters, and has been troubling people for some while. Of the three, jibe with a G is by far the oldest. So this is G-I-B as in baker, E. Jibe, it's by far the oldest. It's been used as a noun, a taunting, sarcastic mm. comment or expression. Those mm. jibes. Absolutely. And as a verb, since the middle of the 16th century. Yeah. Shakespearean Cruel jibe. jibe. We do not see evidence of jibe, J I B E, with the meaning of to be in accord, to be aligned with, until the beginning of the 19th century. Hmm. So no, no nautical reference at all, eh? Oh, well, it might be. I just didn't get that far. Well, it doesn't matter. I just wondered because I sort of made that up. And all that nautical stuff is from reading those hornblower books when I was a kid. right. I 
think we've talked ourselves up. I think the end has finally arrived. All three of us can't think of another word to say about anything in our entire life experience. It's the end. Hmm. Yeah, I'm making this outro into the same kind of clickbaity thing that Scotty Kilmer does on his videos all the time. It's not the end. It's not over. It's just over for now. So we hope you've had fun. We hope you'll get in touch with us if you did or if you didn't or if you want to come on and have some fun. And most of all, we hope you'll just keep taking care of yourself. Keep your head screwed on straight. Don't worry about all the crazy that's going on out there. Just hang with us and everything will be fine. Until you talk to us again, thanks for listening and bye. See ya. You don't want oil in your air filter. (laughs) (laughs) Nobody else is telling you this stuff, so old Scotty's got to tell you.